watching Reason and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome to the show, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Friday evening, joined by, once again, Eric Ibarra, the original R&T duo here. <laughs> we are going over the case of Pope Vigilius. This is going to be a fun one. A lot of stuff going on here. Eric, welcome back to the show. How are you? I'm doing excellent, Michael. I'm doing excellent. Thank you. Um, yes, this is the original duo. I have a quick question. Do you hear yeah. an echo at all? No, not on my end. Okay, give me a second here. Yeah, yeah. Sure, um, no problem. And, and while give, you're give some, yeah, while you're doing yeah, yeah. that. There you go. Yep. Sure. While, you, while you're working on that, let me tell you all about this bad boy that just came in the mail today. There it is, Eric Ibarra, the filioque way. Revisiting the doctrinal debate between Catholics and Orthodox. I had somebody ask me just earlier, why are you guys talking about the filioque way? Isn't this thing all said and done? Actually, there's a little bit more to it than you might think. Um. Some argue, as I just had recently Dr. Goff on the show, that you could bridge the Catholic and Orthodox positions on the matter. Others take a different perspective. Be that as it may, more discussion is most certainly required on the issue of the filioque. So no, uh, this is not something that has just been buried and we should just uh, put in the past. No, we need to continue to have discussions about the filioque. And that's what this book does it brings up maybe uh some of the issues that are kind of still lingering and unresolved as i understand it i have not read it but i've kind of been following uh your work on the filioque eric now i don't want to again speak for you on behalf of your book but maybe you can kind of tell us a little bit more about it uh, for those who are wanting to get a copy and by the way y'all can also get a copy of it on amazon.com and i will make sure to put a link in the uh description of the video but yeah tell us a little bit about the filioque before we dive into um the book i'm sorry into the topic tell us about the book itself awesome yeah sorry for that delay what happened was i had our our link up you know the stream yard video up and i had this uh i had my east the the internet explorer tab that i don't usually use um, that was already set to the YouTube uh, link, so then it was concurrent. It was it was it was very strange. So I'm like, what is going on here? And I finally said, let me look at this Eastern the the Internet uh, the the Explorer option. Boom, there it was. So I'm sorry for the delay. <laughs> no, you're fine. Not a problem. So tell me about the book. Do you think that do you think that the matter of the filioque is unresolved, or no? Do you br bring out in the book maybe some further work that needs to be done between East and West on this? So yeah, this book here, um, it, it it I don't think it achieves uh, reconciliation, um, right. but it definitely will take people who are new. They're inquiring into the issue, basically the 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 beginnings, the 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 milk, the meat, and then and the dessert of the whole dispute. So if I don't know anything about the filioque, this is the book for me. Right. Yeah, I would say I would say it is. And if you if you'll you'll know whether you can go with the tempo of my book within the first like 20 pages. And if you can't, I do recommend two preliminary primers um, that you could get. So if somebody's still like, man, I'm still not getting this. Yeah. There's two short primers that I recommend mm -hmm. um, anybody to read uh, because the filioque is a doctrine that's couched in the trinitarian doctrine so mm -hmm. if you don't know trinitarian doctrine don't mm -hmm. ever think you're going to understand the filioque so um yeah so it, it does not resolve the issue but i do think um i give the the path forward which i think is essentially what metropolitan Callistos ware said in his classic book um the orthodox church i mm -hmm. mean i know it sounds kind of simple but i think his resolution is the best <laughs> um but other other and i think he's i think he's he deserves a lot more credit can, than he gets can we get a sneak peek on what that resolution is yeah absolutely i i think that you know uh he basically uh reduces it down to a standoff between augustine and saint gregory of nyssa mm -hmm. the cappadocian and the augustinian 
way of looking at things. And he says that, you know, both of them understand that there is one God, there's one essence. And, and this supposed difference between the West emphasizing the divine essence and the East emphasizing the, the, the triune personhood and how that's the cause of the clash. Uh, Callistos Ware does not fall for that mythology. And he recognizes, no, both were interested in the, in the unicity of the divine essence and both were interested in how to, to trinitize the, um, with the one divine essence. Um, the second thing he says is that both understand that the father is the primordial font of all generated deity. Mm -hmm. So the father is the font of all mm -hmm. deity. Augustine is very particularly concerned to conserve that as mm -hmm. is the Cappadocians. And the third thing is simply that, um, the uh, filioque, the, the procession of the Holy Spirit, which is really just his eternal production, where he comes from, where his person comes from. And um, a Gregory of Nyssa is insistent that um, it's not, we're not to conceive the Trinity just as like the Father as like a son and the the, the 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 son of God is like one of the rays coming out of one side and the spirit like another ray coming out from the other side. No, no. There's the original son, then there's the light, and then there's the ray that comes from the light. And that's the Holy Spirit that comes from the son and, and ultimately traced back to the father. And Augustine can comport with that, but he does have an irreconcilably different structure to it, but he still differentiates the Son and the Father in the production of the Spirit, where the Son receives the power to spirate. He doesn't have it natively in himself. And so if you can just comport those three things and just say, look, the structures are different. They're not reconcilable. The structure is not. But the product, the, the, uh, the effective orthodoxy of the doctrine is compatible. Um, mm. But we, we just have to be open to seeing that there can be two irreconcilable structures that can reconcile in the essential aim of the teaching. Mm. And that's not easy to do because, you know, both sides want to say that now the structure's got to be the same as well. And uh, I think that if we're willing to at least table the structure and 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 focus on the aim of what we're teaching, then um, we could reconcile. Man, I got so many questions, but what, let, let, I tell you what, let's do let's do another show. Yeah, on this yeah. book specifically. Yeah, no problem. Um, because we we definitely need to get the Vigilius here. Um, all right, so kind of walk us through who exactly was Pope Vigilius? How was he? Um, involved, of course, with the Fifth Ecumenical Council. And after we kind of set the stage, I think at that point we can start to talk about maybe some of the controversies involving him relating yeah. to papal infallibility. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so uh, Pope Vigilius is, you know, one of the successors of Peter. He lived in the um, sixth century. Uh, you, you know, his, his entrance into the papacy was quite controversial. Um, he mm -hmm. follows Pope Silvarius. Um, who was treated unjustly both by um, Byzantine uh, po politicians uh, and Vigilius himself. Um, but that's a, that's a whole nother story. And, and Vigilius, I think, ends up redeeming himself, ironically, because um, most people remember Vigilius for being that, you know, this, this shilly-shallying pope that couldn't get things right and ended up causing massive scandal, and he did. But um, I think that if we were to compare the kind of failure that he went through with what we may have done in his shoes, uh, I think yeah. that uh, I, I think we would have a ton of more mercy mm. on him, you know, mm. uh, than than is typically given in academia. But um, yeah, so he that's his, you know, comes into the fifth, sixth century, and uh, right into the heart of the controversies over Chalcedon. And, you know, there's so much literature on this that has been pumped out in the past um, that continued to be pumped out. Mm. And to this day is still uh, a, a kindling fire in in uh, Christological 
uh, theology. Yeah, um, you know, he was so he came into the debate. It, it would have been very, it would have been very beneficial for him to have been like us, mm. who had all these years of knowing the controversy. He went right there to the heart of it when yeah. it first exploded. So that's another reason why I'm just so empathetic uh, with with his issue, but. Um, that issue was the Council of Chalcedon was really was not accepted in the East very very well. Um, you had uh, large swaths of the bishops in Egypt, in Syria, especially some in Jerusalem initially, um, that really could not tolerate uh, the Chalc Council of Chalcedon, both for its criminality in condemning Dioscorus of Alexandria. Uh, and because of its acceptance of the tome of St. Leo, the Pope of Rome, who they understood to be a Nestorian, basically, hmm. um, unintentionally or intentionally, uh, willingly or unwillingly, they thought his tome was too much on the duality of, of, of Jesus. And um, so the East had a really hard time with this. Um, what that did was it created a massive fracture in the unity of Eastern Catholicism under the emperors and Justinian was the genius that stepped up to the plate to try and resolve the conflict um, basically by trying to figure out how he could tickle the theological ears of those who didn't receive the council of Chalcedon um, you know those they're called today we call them Miaphysites there's you know back then they were called monophysites but um for for uh, good reasons, I'm told not to call the uh, the um, what came what became Oriental Orthodox progeny monophysite, mm -hmm. but miaphysite. Mm -hmm. So we'll just call mm -hmm. them miaphysites. Um, right. Well, Justinian Justinian decided that there's a way to tickle their ears, and the way to do that is to make sure. How can we prove that the Council of Chalcedon is not an historian? And the, the best way to do that is to basically dig out of the grave three men. Uh, three, uh, there's Theodore of Mopsuestia, Theodoret of Cyrus, and um, a uh, Ibas of Edessa. And uh, these three characters were quite famous. It's not just three randos. These are, they, they were, they were, you know, popular uh, writers in their day, especially Theodore of Mopsuestia. Um, and uh, Justinian figured if we could dig out their writings and they 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 began they began to refer to their writings as like these three volumes um the three heads or the three chapters capitulas and the those three chapters were sort of like a collection of their writings kind of like uh maybe the extent of certain writings and then the florilegium of other writings uh which, which were used as an indictment against the three of them. And the idea was, look, um, Miaphysites of Syria, Miaphysites of Egypt, if we can prove to you that we're willing to officially anathematize these men and their writings um, and maintain Chalcedon, would you accept that resolution? And many in the East, were, many those in the Far East that were, uh, uh, that were Miaphysite were they found that that could be a resolution and, and a foraging of the of the uh, unity that they deserve. So um, that's Justinian's plan. Again, he was a genius theologian, but he wasn't a bishop, but he was the emperor. And that, that granted him all kinds of uh, privileges, especially at this time, ripe as he was um, in the church-state wedding. Uh, the Constantinian Revolution was was raining hard. Um, and so he enacted uh, a policy to make, basically make sure that the five patriarchs um, went along with the anathematization of the three chapters, including the Pope. And if he didn't have the Pope of the West, then it was going to be a failed plan. So um, that's Vigilius. He comes into that, that crisis and Vigilius is like, whoa, 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 you know, um, you know, number one. Um, councils don't get called or, you know, the theological decisions don't get decided based on just what the emperor says. Um, and so he, he, you know, he pits the brakes on this, but 
he's forced to Constantinople. So they literally, you know, Justinian dispatched um, representatives to uh, go to Rome and basically forced Vigilius to sail all the way back to the the shores of uh, Constantinople. And um, Vigilius was there for nine years, nine mm. long and hard years um, before he finally and officially capitulated to the condemnation of the three chapters. Um, and it didn't really resolve the issues that Justinian wanted to in the first place. Um, and uh, that that was because th that was due to other factors of more on the disciplinary side. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's Vigilius in a nutshell. You know, he okay. he has this failure of going back and forth, trying to fight with the emperor, trying to um, negotiate, trying to renegotiate, then going back on his first negotiation. And then finally, you know, he gives in, he gives a defense for his view, and then he's allowed to go back to Italy. Unfortunately, he never made it back as he died on the way. Yeah. <clears throat> Walk me through that last part, because there it seems like there's this affirmation of the three chapters, a condemnation, then another affirmation, a condemnation is just back and forth, back and forth. Walk me through the chronology of what Pope Vigilius did here. Yeah. So the the issue with Justinian's plan was that almost everyone perceived it as a threat to the Council of Chalcedon. Mm hmm almost everyone. Um, and uh, that was an issue, especially for Westerners, because um, in the West, you know, some of these writings were not exactly excluded from acceptability. So you did have some Eastern theologians, like in North Africa, that their explanations on Chalcedon were not exactly in the direction of being the most satisfying. They could almost tilt in the direction of Nestorian, um, of the of the two, you know, the two. The, I don't want to say two personality because the Westerners never said two personas, but um, they insisted, you know, they insisted on the the, the unicity of Christ's person. But um, they did have a way of theologizing that was uncomfortable for many Eastern ears, and but uh, Chalcedon accepted. Uh, Theodore of Cyrus because of his acceptance of the Tome of Leo. And he and he anathematized the stories. But he did it under pressure, it seems. Um, and I, I think it was totally genuine, don't get me wrong. But um, anyone who had, uh, you know, wanted to saw that he was vexed with Nestorianism, they would try to bring out the fact that he didn't just initially anathematize uh, Nestorius. It was under pressure in uh, one of the sessions at the council. Um, then Ebos of Edessa was accepted at the Council of Chalcedon um, in the 10th session and some other sessions he's mentioned. Um, so to to call into question the orthodoxy of these two men, which is what the anathematization of the three chapters could communicate, was almost uh, sort of like a, uh, impugning mm -hmm. the value of Chalcedon. Maybe not a wholesale rejection of it, mm -hmm. but still even a slight speck on the Council of Chalcedon. And even for that, the Westerners were not willing to accept. So there, the West was really against what, what Justinian was doing. And Vigilius understood that this was also a possibility too. And, and Chalcedon has to be understood to be divinely irreversible mm -hmm. from top to bottom. Um, and and so, uh, Vigilius is he has quite a care to maintain uh, the the orthodoxy of the fathers and of the four ecumenical councils hitherto, and he was very skeptical about uh, the anathematization of the three chapters because it introduced this new policy of um, it wasn't exactly new but it was new to public ecclesiastics where. You could actually take a writing from a man who had already been dead for 10, 50, you know, 50 or 100 years mm. um, and reverse proleptically condemn them 
<laughs> and and it ba basically excommunicate them from holy memory. And um, this was not a policy that Rome really liked. All the way back to Leo and Galatius, um, they're explicit that you can't do that. They're not they're not in the the court of earth anymore. They've already passed through the judgment of heaven, or, or, or you know the judgment of God. Um, at this point, it's it's outside of our jurisdiction. It's no longer a matter of the church judging. Well, you know, other theologians had a different view, including and unfortunately, a, a Saint Augustine um, defended this idea of of sort of uh, posthumously condemning people. Um, um, that's you know, that's a sad policy that came into the church. I doubt anybody in the pre-Nicene or the immediate post-Nicene era would have accepted that. Um, but it was opportune because if they could condemn Origen and others, uh, it was opportunistic. It was an opportunity for unity for contemporary matters. Um, and so Vigilius didn't, wasn't on board with that. You know, and initially he said, you can't condemn the dead. Hmm. That was a policy that he had. So anathematizing the, those three men is off the table. Um, and even anathematizing their writings is an issue that we shouldn't divulge in because the, the record is settled. Theodoret uh, ended his life a Chalcedonian, and so did Ebos of Edessa. Now, Theodore of Mopsuestia, he wrote some writings that were obviously Nestorian. Even Vigilius admitted that. But the authenticity of whether Theodore actually wrote those writings was a question of the day. And so Vigilius said it wouldn't be safe for the church to just bulldoze a condemnation on Theodore when we don't know if he wrote these writings. So I think Vigilius' initial hesitations were entirely wise. Mm -hmm. and I think anybody today would think that as well. Yeah. But um, I, I think that you know, 16th century, uh, I'm sorry, 6th century um, Catholic, uh, ca you know, Catholicism at the time um, had it had a willingness to go through with this. And and it's a, I think it's a sad policy. I think we, I think the church accepted it, but then rejected it later. I don't think we would do that today. Um, so um, it took Vigilius a long time to see that this would be a good thing to do. As long as the, uh, Theodoret and Ebos were not condemned, their persons were not condemned, we can condemn some of their old writings that were uh, clearly Nestorian. Um, we can go ahead and anathematize Theodore because he just capitulated to the idea of the dead being anathematized after so much pain in Constantinople. He just had to give way. Um, but Vigilius never went through a process where he was orthodox, became a heretic, and then recanted and became an orthodox. That's not how the process went. Um, even in his letter where he recanted at the very, very end, um, he opens up by saying that he's always blamelessly persevered in the true faith. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that means that whatever, um, whatever variances there were in his prior judgments... He he cat he he um he relegated those things to sort of like um, innocent confusions that were in, concocted by the devil, um, and he even compared himself to Saint Augustine, who at the end of his life um, had his uh, retractations, uh, where he you know he kind of I don't he just amazing scholar went through almost all his writings and tried to figure out where he was wrong. Now, nobody would go back and say, oh, Augustine, you went from being a heretic to being an orthodox to being a heretic, you know, just based off. Of, so it wasn't until your retractations that you became a true member of the body of Christ. That's insane, you know, even. But so Vigilius compared himself to that kind of correction, which is not a correction of like formal heresy to formal re-inclusion into the church if that makes sense. It does. Now, I want to talk about some of the difficulties involving Vigilius's retraction, but kind of walk me through what exactly happened chronologically. He issued multiple documents, but they contradicted each other. What's the order of them? Yeah, so initially he he published a document called the Iudicatum, 
um, or in English, you could just say judicatum, um, which is just a decree. You know, it's it's just a decree um, condemning the three chapters. And this is something he did quite soon after arriving in Constantinople. Um, but as soon as he saw the uproar and the confusion that this document was going to, re uh, to create um, in the West, especially, um, he, he, he negotiated with the emperor to say, hey, can we just sort of like table this and put this into slow motion? Because we really need to be concerned and we need to be sensitive about the souls and the minds of our brothers in the West who think that were basically anathematizing Chalcedon. And at first, Justinian was like, yeah, let's, you know, he went along with this idea. So they tabled the Judicatum. And um, the plan was to get together and figure out how we could get a council uh, called, um, an official council where the East and the West could be duly represented. And uh, Vigilius would have the accompanying help from his native lands, so bishops from Italy, to ac accompany him. Uh, he wanted more than whatever he had with him, apparently, because he did come to Constantinople with with a you know with a, a, a an entourage basically. Um, but that council was not successful at first. There was a lot of tussling going back and forth, and Justinian came out being more forceful about it more heavy-handed about it um even replaced the patriarch of alexandria because the former one didn't want to go along with the plan so he he fired him and hired another guy who he knew <laughs> would agree um he he anathematized or not anathematized but he he basically uh fired a bunch of bishops in north africa who he knew were um vocal against his three chapters uh, condemnation and, um, you know, replaced the Carthagin Carthaginian representatives with people who were compliant with his policy. Um, so he was heavy handed and, and, and the Pope realized this. A lot of the intelligence that Vigilius was getting while he was there in the imperial city was telling him that, that Vigilius was trying to be more heavy handed. Um, so then Vigilius published another uh, document, um, and th there's some history that's already going on. Remember, this is nine years, so it's impossible to go mm -hmm. through each thing. But the next big thing that happened was Vigilius saw that an ecumenical council that was appropriate was not feasible. And so he wrote what's, what's called his first constitutum, which is just another, it's like a constitution, you know, just another decree. And in this constitution, he comes down with his own heavy hand, um, basically going through the three chapters. So Theodore's writings, and, and, and he condemns all the Nestorian writings in Theodore of Mopsuestia, but he calls into question their authenticity to, to Theodore himself. Then he goes through Theodoret and basically defends Theodoret for being... Um, accepting Chalcedon, accepting the tome, and then Ebos of Edessa, which is really the, you know, the, the heart of the, the crux here, um, or the crux here, is um, Ebos of Edessa's writings, nam namely his letter to a, a, a certain man named Marie, uh, who was a Persian. And Vigilius defended that letter, in a way that tried to prove that it was Chalcedonian. So he, he did it with a lot of help. He had theological advisors with him there in Constantinople. And he was, I thought he's quite success, successful. I've read the English translation of it. And I, I, I thought he did a good job, to be quite honest. Um, so through and through, the Pope was meticulous in my, in, in my reading and in, I think, standards of, of, of more, um, tame no, no more tame standards um he was quite careful you know he knew what chalcedon taught he knew that there was false interpretations of it he knew where what nestorian was nestorianism was and he he condemned the nestorianism in the three chapters but he did not want to condemn any of the persons well that was in his first constitution which was not accepted <laughs> 
mm-hmm. in Constantinople. Right. Um, Justinian did not accept that it was not good enough. Um, I mean, he the, he wanted the, the 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 emperor wanted him to go all the way, just go all the way. And at this point, a council was called, and uh, you know the eastern bishops were assembled, and they did have uh, associated bishops. Um, meeting in Constantinople, but Vigilius just didn't recognize its opening session. He just didn't recognize it. You know? mm-hmm. um, he didn't have the Western, the, the Department of the West that he wanted, um, and he just didn't think it was a legitimate call. Well, then the Justinian came down with a strong measure. You know, he sent instructions to the council to remove Vigilius from the diptychs of Constantinople. Mm. So basically excommunicating Pope Vigilius. Um, and the bishops complied, and they they appealed to the fact that he alienated himself by a refusal to give a wholesale condemnation to the three chapters. So they, they thought the Pope was a supporter of Nestorius because mm-hmm. they, the, they said, lest we commune with Nestorius, let's get Vigilius out of, um, out of office or let's let's uh suspend him from communion so it's clear that the the eastern bishops just jumped to the idea that he was a supporter of nestorianism which is i don't understand how that makes any sense mm-hmm. because even in the first constitution it, it, there's it's it's a, it's a massive document where he systematically goes through where nestorianism comes up and he condemns it he condemns it over and over and over again almost in 61 extracts from Theodore of Mopsuestia. So I, I, I just don't know how they, it, it, to me, it seems kind of brash, you know, mm-hmm. just jumped to that conclusion. And it's the same thing with the, the emperor. Well, six months later, um, the Pope tur- makes a turnaround. Um, and, you know, he capitulates to the idea of anathematizing the dead as it pertained to Theodore of Mopsuestia. And he recognized that the letter of Ibas of Edessa was actually not to be defended as Chalcedonian, which he did before, but is actually to be condemned because it does fall victim to Nestorianizing doctrine. Um, and and so he releases what's the third document or the third famous document um, is the third, the second constitutum of the second constitution, where in this one. Um, he doesn't appeal like to the authority of the council, like the council has the authority to decide this, um, or that he was a heretic and that he was an historian and now he found the truth. No, he basically said by the authority of the papacy, he annuls his first constitution constitution. So it's like, he didn't even think his first constitution was annulled yet. (laughs) Mm. Um, so he opens up by saying, by the authority of the Apostolic See, we annul all the previous uh, decrees of the Apostolic See. So here's a recognition of the Pope that the previous decrees of the Apostolic See were reformable. And this is an idea that you brought to me when I was talking to you about this probably a year ago or so. Mm. And uh, um, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an observation to, to, to keep. Mm-hmm. Um and then he also says it's it's by his own authority that the new constitution stands up. Yeah. Um, and so he basically does conform to the theological and the disciplinary decisions of the council. And as a result of this, Justinian went back into the, the acts of the council and expunged from the council all of the texts that talk about his name being removed from the diptychs. Um, so that, that actually didn't get put into the official acta of the council. It wasn't known in the West, at least um, that I can remember. I, there, there are some people who know about what happened with him. They write about it in chronologies, but um, nobody really talks about this fallout of, of mm. Fagilius from communion um, until centuries later when the east found that they could u- utilize it mm-hmm. as a as an argument against the papacy but interestingly enough nothing that happened with vigilius um t- uh, toned down the papacy <laughs> yeah um it would be something if oh my goodness look at what happened with vigilius now we know now we know that the apostolic see has to be 
uh, more closely held accountable, more closely monitored, and not given sort of um, supremacy uh, of doctrinal authority. Um, no, what well, what we see coming out of the Vigilius event is uh, two two councils which are the most explicit on uh, papal uh, supremacy, which is co uh, the Council of Constantinople three, which is held in 681, and then the Council of Nicaea two in 787, both of which contain material text that just blow you away with how, how uh, clear they understood the divinity of the institution of the papacy. So the Vigilius event did not inform anyone Oh, okay, now we get it. This whole Petrine story that, that you guys talk about, that's just a bunch of nonsense. Hmm. No, that's not how they saw it. Um, but at the same time, um, the first constitutum was quite forceful. And so um, Vigilius's reversal of that constitution has loomed large in uh, the minds of theo theologians and canonists and then obviously, you know, Protestants and Orthodox, because they see in it a, a sort of like a way to defuse hmm. uh, pap the papacy. Do you happen to have in front of you the, the language that Vigilius used that makes it sound like he's teaching something infallibly that could never be reversed? So the for I so this is. I, I'm I'm indebted to Father mm -hmm. Richard Price. Um, mm -hmm. If you guys want to learn more about Vigilius, read this book and then get almost every secondary l piece of literature that he cites mm -hmm. um, to to really get into this controversy. Um, in the first Constitutum, um, and and this we we kind of have to backtrack here because this. Uh, a, a, a contemporary Catholic defense of Vigilius does require incorporating the development of ex cathedra conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in, in other words, uh, in other words, if you're under if you're under the impression that the doctrine of the papacy means that everything the Pope teaches is infallible, then yeah. There's enough material here to diffuse the papacy and basically put it out of business, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this does require this development, which I don't think is some sort of like, uh, oh, we came up with this idea to sort of, you know, pass the test of history. All we got to do is just, you know, reconfigure where the points actually matter. Um, you know, I know that I know it's tempting to go that route. Of course, I was a former Anglican. I would have appealed to that. Um, but the the uh, the limiting of irreformability to only certain conditions um, is actually quite normal. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be terrible if someone said that everything that the, the, the apostles taught, whether it was at a campfire or you know that breakfast that breakfast brunch or something was infallible that would be terrible um you know it's 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 only on certain conditions where where the um where the content of the teaching reaches to the point of membership it, it's critical and sensitive to one's soul and membership in the church and you know that's kind of where this comes in. Now, in the first constitution, Vigilius does excommunicate uh, anyone who disagrees with him. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, the, the language that he uses uh, to um, anathematize anyone who disagrees with him is not a doctrinal definition mm -hmm. defending the Nestorianism of mm -hmm. Ebas's letter, <laughs> mm -hmm. right. you know, that would be so like if, if, if Pope Vigilius wrote an, wrote a decree, um, a strong decree excommunicating anybody who does not agree with, you know, a precise definition that was Nestorian, you know, in content, then, then I think you'd have a good case, you mm -hmm. know, for how this might be something like, like a, like a fatality to the papacy, whatever you want to call it. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is all that the language shows is that Vigilius was concerned about 
the irreversibility of Chalcedon. And so his first constitution, that section where he really announces the authority of the apostolic see and, and, and makes a definitive judgment, all he's doing is he's saying that Chalcedon's judgment on the letter can't be reformed. So that's not exactly a doctrinal definition. That's a point to a location and a statement about the irreversibility of that locus. You know, the question is, because it does involve an appeal or a, a reference to the factual error of Ibas's letter, does that then um, does that then impugn the doctrine of the papacy? And um, you know, I think that the theologians have. Uh, and this is something I wrestled with, and you know, I, I, I did, I did wrestle with it. So I don't want to make it seem like this was something that was just, oh yeah, no, we just, you know, mm -hmm. we just sort of, mm -hmm. re, you know, move things around, recondition mm -hmm. things here and there, and we get over it real, real easily. No, I think it is very difficult to do this, but I think it's reasonable, and I think it's mm -hmm. the only way to, it's it's the only way to clear the way of. Uh, falsification to both East and West, really. How, how would this impact the East? Yeah, so I, I think it would impact the East. So if we were if we were to say that, you know, the Pope's judgment here was heretical, for example, I think that uh, then it would call into question their acceptance of the letter of Agatho at, to the Sixth Ecumenical Council, which does speak about the infallibility of the apostolic see. So that made it into the text of an ecumenical council. Speaking of conciliar fundamentalism, you know, the people of the sixth century dealing with this council, they were so concerned about every single letter uh, of, the, of the council. Well, you've got those letters in the sixth ecumenical council, which say that the Pope or the papacy, the See of Peter is infallible. Well, how do you put this together with that? If those two things are nailed into the ground and there's no questioning those things, then you have to figure out how Vigilius can commit what he did, the kind of error he did, and still maintain what Agatho said and still maintain what the formula of Hormizda said. You know, so if somebody wants to maintain the councils, they're almost required to go in here and say, okay, not everything, not every error that the Pope makes is going to the heart of the Petrine ministry. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know the, if that makes uh, sense. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but we can also look at how Vigilius himself responded um, in, in his letter to Eutychius. So this is known as the recantation letter. Uh, and if anybody has the, the book... Um, the Acts of the Council of Constantinople of 553, uh, which has the Acts by uh, translated by Father Richard Price, you can go to volume two, um, page uh, 215, and this is how Vigilius describes himself. Mm -hmm. He says, us, us who are residing with our brethren and fellow bishops in the imperial city and who uphold the four councils with equal reverence and blamelessly persevere in the one and the same faith of these four councils with the result that we, who were and are in agreement over the one faith, spurned brotherly love and were seduced into discord. So he basically says that he has persevered in the faith, but that the devil has concocted a confusion between brothers. So it's it's not very likely that Vigilius saw the the removal of his name from the diptychs as as official. Mm. I don't think he probably did see that as valid. Um, we don't have any statements from him on the point, um, but uh, we 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 do know that you know that was expunged from the council, probably at the insistence of the Pope, um, and also because uh, Justinian it would have been embarrassing to have. Um, the excommunication of the Pope and his recantation, his, his recantation in one council—that's not really, um, you know, a good advertising. Uh, 
policy mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. for the for the cops and the Syrians. Um, so uh, it, it, it it seems clear to me that we have to find some way. If even if I haven't found the way to do it yet, we have to find some way in which Vigilius's first constitution is not uh, a transgression of the doctrine of papal infallibility. Um, and I, I, this is not something that Catholicism, it, it's not something that's simply at stake for Catholicism. Like I said, it's also for those who hold the next two ecumenical councils. It's also at stake for them as well. Um, so, and, and I think you, you would probably, if you looked into this, knowing what you know, you probably would be able to articulate this better than I. Um, but it seems to me that the, uh, the forceful condemnation of anyone who disagreed with his first constitution, um, was something that the Pope himself annulled and called a mistake. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a doctrinal definition. It mm -hmm. was more. It was more along the lines of, we we don't want to impugn Chalcedon. It def Chalcedon defends this letter. The Pope thought it was the uh, 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 a certain letter. He was wrong about that fact. That doesn't amount to an ex cathedra teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know? and I do intend to dive into it more myself. I'm working on reversible teachings and reversibility in the magisterium the focus is more in the second millennium but i, I do intend to look at the case of vigilius deeper than i have already just because it seems to me like that might be the one in the first millennium that might present the most uh yeah. you, you know most material when it comes to issues of magisterial reversals i mean maybe i'm wrong maybe there's some other cases but to me that's the one that has kind of stuck out the most and the first millennium so it has and honorius got a lot of undue credit i think <laughs> i don't right. think honorius the situation is as difficult to deal with so yeah that that might be number two but to me the case of pope vigilius might in my opinion be number one so but the fact the, the fact that the fact that his excommunication was expunged from the acts though mm -hmm. um explains why it was not readily available material for opponents of the papacy in the immediate future. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would see constant appeals. Oh, remember Vigilius, remember Vigilius, remember Vigilius. We don't see anything like that. Um, the only thing people remember, I think, in the ninth century was Honorius. So it's just interesting how this got forgotten. Did they say why they expunged it from the Acts? No, they don't. In fact, you know, I actually had to do some digging for this. Um, if you go to academia, if the listeners go to academia, I have an article um, on the Constituta of Vigilius. If you read that article, uh, I provide um, uh, statements to various Eastern Orthodox historians, uh, in particular, one manuscript historian. Um, his name escapes me, and I would never be able to pronounce it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I was able to, with the help of uh, Google Translate, uh, translate my English emails mm -hmm. into Greek for him to read and then translate right. his Greek emails to English. Right. And um, he pointed me to uh, his own commentary on the Acts of the Council, um, wherein he he admits that the, these were expunged in the final edition of the Acts. Um, he and we're, historians are left to speculate. You know, some speculate that the Pope obviously didn't want that there. Um, right. Others can speculate and say, well, Justinian thought it would look bad. So, you know, now that now that everybody was on the same page, we can kind of make the council look like it was just a, everybody's on the same page here. This is one, two, three, boom, boom, you know, bada bing. So. I, I kind of wonder how the expunging of his excommunication from the Acts comports with conciliar fundamentalism and those that would maintain it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I, maybe, perhaps they would say, "Well, you know what what we would actually consider to be, um, you know, definitive is actually that which was promulgated, and perhaps the excommunication was promulgated. It was expunged before it was promulgated. I don't, I don't know." Yeah, it's just it's 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 um it, it's really tough to maintain when you're yeah. in the you know it's it's easy to claim conciliar fundamentalism, right. but when you have to sit in front of someone who's testing that, like right. you know, 
and you have to look look like you make any sense um that's when it becomes hard a little harder yeah i agree <laughs> i'm looking at the chat uh here y'all go ahead and send some chat questions um while we give them time and by the way make sure to put them to at reason and theology so i can pick them out from the comments that i'm seeing uh but while we're waiting on them to send chat questions um any final thoughts that we didn't touch on on pope vigilius that you wanted to get to um, the case in general, you know. Yeah, no, I, you know, the 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 the, the main thing I wanted to get across uh, was that, um, you know, some people today, like Orthodox Protestants and others, um, they look at this event and they see all the like legal uh, conditionality that has to be brought into the picture in order right. to in order to make make this straighten out for the for the credibility and the palatability of papal claims. Um, this isn't something that is a Catholic, Roman Catholic problem. This is a problem with the consistency of the seven ecumenical councils themselves. Okay. I mean, like we've already said, the, the infallibility of the apostolic see is already inside the seven ecumenical. It's within the boundaries of the seven of the seven ecumenical councils so this isn't uh like a roman catholic lawyering out of mm. things okay a catholic is just simply saying hey we've got a clear emphatic statement of infallibility based on the gospel of matthew based on the gospel of luke based on the gospel of john in the councils vigilius is not a big advertisement in the councils at all in fact none of the councils in their final editions has the error nor the first constitution of vigilius so this is kind of like um behind the scenes mm -hmm. <laughs> facts mm -hmm. that we're dealing mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. that's that's that has to be re remembered but secondly um that i i think we have enough even within vigilius's own recanting to see that he did not see himself as making a doctrinal error mm -hmm. uh, of the kind that would impugn the institution of the papacy. He appeals to the institution of the papacy in his recanting constitution, the second one. So if this was somehow an abrogation to the papacy, it that would have been news to Vigilius, and yeah. nobody had a problem with the second constitution. It's not like it's not like the Greeks re responded and said, oh, no, that's not good enough. You need to admit that, you know, you were a heretic and you need to admit that you don't have any authority on the matter. No. No, they, they, they didn't do that. Um, they accepted the fact that he appealed to his own authority and uh, that was good enough for the Byzantines. So it should be good enough for us. Was the first constitutum um, actually promulgated by the Pope fully? So that's that's another thing. If we had a lot of time, we could look into that. Um, so uh, some historians have said it wasn't officially promulgated because it was a letter to Justinian with the intention for Justinian to publish it. So some people say, well, Providence stopped that from happening because Vigilius wouldn't do it. So some people can say, well, with the dynamics of magisteria, that may not have been an official decree of the magisterium of the pope mm -hmm. that's a possibility i'm just not right. educated enough on it to really yeah. you know um, yeah you know to really I mean, say that, see that that's a pretty important factor oh yeah um, <clears throat> yeah i mean the other thing is just and i mentioned this in my book is that some historians have said that neither constitution can really be considered really authoritative or infallibly authoritative because the pope was under duress the entire time right but that that is a harder argument mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. to, to make to, to make but i understand why somebody would do that i mean he really mm -hmm. was it, it really wasn't a decree that he made at his own home at his own disposal right. where he got every one of the resources that he wanted he right. was in a corner you know but so, the pressure that he had on him is it perhaps equivalent to the same pressure that the bishops had on them in, in right, accepting exactly. the so, yeah. council? I mean, yeah, if, we if still, we're going to say, well, yeah. then, okay, well, that somehow invalidates it. Well, 
it, does that mean that the fifth ecumenical council fifth ecumenical council is a validate well but we could then still say but the other ecumenical councils affirmed the fifth ecumenical council so the and those were accepted yeah. without yeah, pressure exactly. I mean, there, so you there's could all maybe kinds still of get ways. away yeah there's all kinds of ways to resolve it but i i think the main thing to get out here is that yes this happened at the fifth council mm -hmm. and even if we were to give okay fine you protestants orthodox you got three points on us you got a three-pointer on us here but what happens in the future at the next mm -hmm. council and then the next council? You know, we see there no toning down of the claims to divine supremacy. Now, if it was the case that at the next council they said, okay, we're not going to hand, we're not going to talk, we're not going to accept the authority of the Pope, we're not going to accept this whole Petrine theory because of what happened with Vigilius, then I would say, okay. I think you Protestants and Orthodox are back in the game with this. And maybe that, you know, your point there um, will determine the game. But we don't see that. You know, so I understand a Protestant who doesn't accept any of the councils necessarily, um, who would say that, you know, he doesn't need to cohere all of the, the contents of those councils. But for an Orthodox, I think they, they're in the same boat as us. So this one is from Samuel. What would you make of Minas's condemnation of the three chapters qualified by his ability to retract it at the behest of Rome in accordance with the libellus accepted at 536? Yeah, so Minas of Constantinople did, um, he did make a qualification initially, which said that his, his signature only has valid force uh, when the Pope ends up supporting it. Um, so there's that. I think that's important to note. Um, I mean, the, the, the extent of it shows that the Patriarch of Constantinople understood that the doctrinal authority of Rome was superior than himself. Um, you know, does it prove the papacy qua papacy or qua Vatican I? Obviously not. But I think it's a massively important observation to make. This is from Justin. Is the formal versus material heresy concept a defined teaching? That's a, that's a you question, man. I, I, I don't feel comfortable with that. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's not to my knowledge, but I mean, the thing is, it's not that that's not even needed. Right. right. Um, there are quite a few things that we can know with moral certainty without any kind of definition. The only time we need a magisterial intervention that offers a definitive settlement on something is when it's really, really, really in dispute. To my knowledge, I don't know anybody that's really disputing the distinction between formal versus material. It's something that is impossible to deny. I mean, there's a difference between a person who maintains something that is heretical but without knowing that it is against a dogma versus somebody who maintains something that is heretical and knows it is against the dogma there's clearly a difference so the distinction is i mean obvious it's self-evident when you just work through the terms so i don't see a need for such a definition but of course if there were some major controversy and somebody's out there really uh confusing people the magisterium could offer some kind of um, intervention and give a definitive judgment on the matter. But it, it's it's kind of like, is there a definitive teaching about the necessity of humans, you know, drinking water or something like that yeah. to survive? Yeah. No, but is it really needed? You know, yeah. <laughs> do we really yeah. need that? Obviously we need water in order to survive, right? Right. It'd be like saying, you know, we need a, we need a definition saying that human beings can communicate before we can communicate. Right. It's just, it's not really needed. Yeah. This is from James interviews. Um, how influential was Dr. Richard's price accounts of, of Vigilius on you? Do you agree with his assessment? Yeah. So my memory is a little loose on exactly every detail that father Richard price brought up about Vigilius. Um, I don't think I would agree uh, just based off of what I can remember. Uh, Father Richard Price is a fantastic historian, um, and um, he, he's got the theology down very well, too. Um, but every detail, I I can't remember enough, and I'd be here too long wasting everyone's time trying to remember. So I'll have to table that one. <laughs> This is from Elijah Halberg. How would you respond to the charge that this refutes what Roman Catholics 
we'll call the heresy of conciliarism, since the ecumenical council asserts its authority over Pope Vigilius. Yeah, well, the first thing I would say to respond to that is that the idea of uh, bishops getting into a council to announce the vacation, the vacation of the the pope, the the papacy, um, is not is not something that was uh, rejected by the West. So, for example. Um, Nobody disputes the fact that Innocent III, Pope Innocent III, was at the zenith of papal power. <laughs> I mean, um, he has more, you know, explicit and strong statements on the authority of the papacy than the modern day popes. But he even recognized that there could be conditions precisely on when the pope was a formal so in other words he wasn't just materially erroneous where the pope actually came out and you know hey here are the propositions of the christian faith and these are wrong you know a formal heretic of some sort um even he admitted that that kind of a situation could yield a quasi judgment of the pope not as a real judgment of the pope in terms of um, judge and you know defendant or plaintiff but sort of like an announcement of fact that the pope has self forfeited his place um so and that that kind of comports with what the bishops at constantinople 553 said because they said he that vigilius alienated himself from the church by his his quote unquote heresy so it's not really a, a refutation because um, the Latin West from the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, all the way to the present has always understood that there could be conditions where something like what happened to Vigilius could be reproduced. Even those theologians who were the most anti-conciliarist like Juan Torquemada and St. Robert Bellarmine. So the Vigilius event is not ipso facto some sort of game over mm -hmm. for, for, for people who hold to the papacy because it wasn't a game over for all of the papalists all these centuries. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 it's, it doesn't remove the difficulty of the situation. Um, you know, it, it's always difficult, even, even in the orthodox understanding of removing a patriarch that's never easy you know um it's 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 not as easy it's not easy in catholicism either um and there's debates on whether it could even happen but notice that the vigilius event is not a clear situation where it's you've got this irreversible documentation of a heretical pope it doesn't even show up in the acts anymore mm. You know what I'm saying? So it's not like we're dealing with like this is a firm and settled fact of ecclesiastical mm -hmm. history. We're dealing with a situation that happened and it's, you know, it's not disputed that it happened, but it doesn't make up a record in the in the official acts of the council. So I would say that it, it's not a refutation of papalism. Um, I would say it's not necessary, and, and therefore, it's not necessarily a defense of conciliarism. This one is from Credo. <clears throat> Didn't Pope Leo say councils were of no force unless the Pope ratifies them? Seems like innocent actually said that, but maybe Leo did as well. Yes, yeah, so um, many popes said this. In fact, the mm -hmm. popes, popes, popes used to just recite some of the the famous statements of the other popes in the past um, mm -hmm. from the papal chancery, you know, the papal archives, they used to just copy and paste some of the statements and they'd have their, their script, the people who were doing the script to just, you know, refer to innocent statement here about this or refer to Pope Boniface here. Uh, so I know Pope Boniface said this in four four twenty two. I know that um, innocent, like you said, innocent, the first said it in four sixteen. Um, Leo the first definitely did say it. I, I just can't remember. He does say it in, in several of his letters. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Celestine says it. Um, 
Pope Galatius especially says it. Uh, and then after that, popes are just referring to those statements of the of the fifth century popes. But yeah, that is true. So that that is a good point. You know, like how does how does Constantinople five five three have any standing without papal approval? Um, that's a question for the Orthodox to answer. You know, I, I I think they have to come out saying that they don't need papal approval, which which then puts them into massive collision with other patristic statements. Um, there was another council here, or question here. Can you expand on how this would affect the other ecumenical councils talking about the issue of the Julius? Yeah, so it does, you know, it, it kind of shows that there's redaction potential for councils. In other words, councils can have a final edition. Um, it, so it gives us that sense that certain things can be edited out of a council, I think. Um and it doesn't directly affect any of the other councils. It, 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 what it does it sh is it shows how robust the fathers were in trying to preserve every letter of a council, which, which may end up showing um, shedding light on why the final edition of the fifth council did not have the excommunication of Vigilius, because they knew that if they incorporated that, then that event would then get sanct sacrosanct status. Um, so the fact that they avoided that is 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 a key observation, I think. This is a fun one. What do you make of the alleged error of Vigilius when John the Fourth of Jerusalem argues the two Meophysites in the five seventies that we're right because we have Rome, which is infallible? Yeah. So I I don't recall this. I do recall uh, an appeal to Vigilius at the sixth Ecumenical Council. Um. You know, where there's a letter of Agilius where he seems to teach the two wills of Christ or the two energies. I can't remember which one or the other. I don't remember if the appeal was on the basis that Rome was infallible. If that's true, please, I'd, I'd like to know uh, the reference. <laughs> I think that'd be an interesting one to take a look at. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on and doing this, Eric. We're going to be doing another show here in a little bit for patrons only, for patrons and not, not only just those who are supporting me on Patreon, but also those who are members of the uh, RNT YouTube channel here. So you could either uh, hit the join button below to get access to extra videos or go to patreon.com forward slash reason and theology and you'll get access to extra videos, including the one that we're going to be doing uh, in just a little bit, which will be up tonight. And that is going to be on the donation of Constantine. So everybody, again, take a look at that. Be sure to subscribe too. I would greatly appreciate it if you do. Also, share this on your social media. Really, uh, it'd be great if you help spread the word. Eric, go ahead and put in a plug uh, for your work and your channel. Yeah, so I have a YouTube channel. It's kind of unknown. <laughs> um, it's called Classical Christian Thought. And uh, there's two videos on there from years ago that I did. But you know, I haven't added to it. Uh, I hope to in the near future. But other than that, I have uh, two books that uh, I'd like the listeners to be aware of. I know they're already aware of one of them. Um, the, uh, oh, I'm a, oh, here it is. Uh, the Filioque book. I know for those coming in at the last minute that didn't see the beginning, this book just released, a little 400-page book on the Filioque. Easy to read, easy format. Um, footnotes are well done. And then also my first book, Melchizedek and the Last Supper, um, a book on teasing out the typology of Melchizedek and how it relates to evidence of the Catholic doctrine of the Mass. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to the papacy one, too. And I'm going to have you oh, yes. on to talk about the Filioque one once, once I get the chance to read it. So everybody Thank stay you, tuned for that. Yeah. And uh, looking forward to this one here in just a moment on the donation of uh, Constantine. But everybody, again, check us out. Patreon.com forward slash reason and theology or join the channel to get access to that one. We'll see you all later. God bless. Hey, RNT fans, if you're looking to buy a home or sell a home and would like a realtor who shares your beliefs, be sure to check out our sponsor, realestateforlife.org, and be sure to tell them Reason.